Okay, um, welcome everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending which part of the world you're in. Thank you for joining us for our latest uh, webcast session, Fraud, Prevention and Detection, the Impact of Corporate Governance, Internal Controls and Culture. And we're doing this in partnership with the Open University Business School. Um, very pleased with the very high attendance we have. We have people from uh, pretty much every continent in the world and there's uh, uh, over 300 of you, so thank you for your interest. Um, this webcast is going to take about 50 minutes. We have a lot to cover, so we're going to do our best to do it within that time frame. Um, I want to introduce you to today's uh, participants. My name is Dan French. I'm founder and CEO of Consider Solutions, and I know many of you and many of you have participated in our previous webcasts. But I'm delighted to welcome, uh, to share his experience and research, Dr. Devendra Kodwani, who's Professor of Financial Management and Corporate Governance at the Open University Business School. Welcome, Devendra. Thanks, Dan. Good to be with you. So uh, we are obviously much younger and more attractive than we look in these photographs, but we didn't want to offend anybody. Um, so um, give you a little bit of context and perspective about why we're talking about this. Those of you who know Consider Solutions will have seen this picture before, but we focus on this aspirational goal of world class finance, which is about driving improved business results cutting down the cost of finance operations, optimizing cash flow and having better risk management. And we do that in, in a series of kind of practice pillars, if you like, financial control and compliance, which is largely about internal controls of financial reporting, Sarbanes-Oxy and the like, broader risk assurance, enterprise risk management, fraud, waste, error, anti-corruption, and that's very much the, the topic of today, and financial process optimization, how to streamline and optimize the end-to-end -end process in organizations. And all that's built on a platform of technology and data, which of course is the fuel of today's organization. We, um, we have some influences on our thinking. Obviously, the context of today a lot is, the, is to do with the research that Dr. Kudwani has, uh, has really shared with us. But we also develop a lot of our insights from the organizations around the world we deal with. And these are big uh, names, globals, and you'll recognize many of the brands there. So thank you for all your insights. And I know some of you are on the call today. So in terms of agenda, um, that's my introduction. I want to talk a little bit about what's been going on to uh, change the context of fraud or our perspectives on fraud. Um, I'm then going to introduce uh, Devendra Kadwani to talk a little bit about fraud perspectives from the from his work and his research and looking more at governance internal controls and cultural impacts and some very interesting case studies then i'm going to come back and just kind of wrap it up with some considerations and maybe some recommendations for us all to think about and then we're going to have a q a obviously to have a q a you have to submit some q so uh, please uh, ask questions as we go through there is a panel on the system which you can see on the GoToWebinar panel, you ask a question as you go through, please do it as early as you think about it, and we'll gather them up at the end, endeavor to answer them. Uh, for where we don't have time, we will get back to you by email. So please be prolific with your questioning, and we'll try and be prolific with our answering. Uh, so if you have any technical problems, please uh, use the same uh, mechanism, and our team will uh, get back to you and help you. So that's the, uh, that's the setup, if you like. Now, we're not going to let you sit there and uh, listen to the uh, the insights. We want to get you a little bit involved. So just very simple poll for you. Uh, what's your primary role? This should be easy. Um, uh, so your primary role, are you A, in internal audit, B, in risk management, internal controls or compliance, C, in a specific fraud prevention role, D, in finance, or E, in some other role? Please select one. Should be quite straightforward. Um, so I'll give you 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's have a look. Let's see what we've got. So, interestingly enough, the biggest 32% uh, of you are in internal audit, which probably isn't a surprise. 30% are in other, which probably tells me we could have done better at breaking down these roles. Um, only 2% are in specific fraud prevention roles. Um, that's interesting. 25% in risk management, internal controls and compliance, and 11% in finance. That's, um, I think the internal audit majority is not a surprise, so thank you for that. That gives you all a bit of context and us some context as we go through. <coughs> so, what's been going on? So, in my perspectives, and when we think about these uh, challenges of, of 
of how organizations are changing and how our exposure to certain risks are, are increasing, it's important to think about the context of how we got to where we are. And I think there's two big drives. One is for 30 to 40 years, we've been pushing the efficiency driver, efficiency lever in organizations. And a lot of that's been to do with simplification, standardization, and automation. So if we look at the images from the top right, to the, the picture of the globe, it's now very common, more common than not, for organizations, certainly large organizations, to, have, to be pretty boundaryless internally. So you can work with suppliers in Australia to deliver goods and services to Bolivia and have it all settled and accounted for and paid in a shared service center in Krakow in Poland. And that's enabled by common processes, end-to-end -end processes automated by ERP systems and the simplification of shared service centers. Well, that's, that's great uh, and it's improved operations no end. But the one thing to remember is now there is no longer a line of sight by, by any individual over the end-to-end -end process execution. When I started work, it was pretty obvious end-to-end -end process execution, the managers and supervisors knew pretty much what was going on. Uh, now there's no one who sees that and we rely on systems and controls and policies to uh, get a view of that. Now, we're doing all this simplification, standardization and integrated process. But if you listen to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, they've been telling us for 20 years that typical organization use is equivalent to 5% of its revenues to fraud, waste and error each year. Now, 5% of revenue is an enormous percentage of profit uh, and a massive number. So, yeah, that's not good. So something is not right. What's even more concerning is that number is actually creeping up. And the latest number I saw from the ACFE was about 6.7%. So we've got a challenge here. Now, it's not all fraud because as they assert, you know, you can't tell. Sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference between fraud and waste until you, or fraud and error until you see the intent. But it's an important aspect. Bottom left, you see the kind of classic breakdown of types of, um, of fraud with asset misappropriation being by far the highest uh, occurrence. And that's basically stealing company property uh, or misusing it. Um, and then, of course, it's important that we bear in mind just simple error and with all of this progress we're making one would assume that it's getting easier and cheaper to assure our business operations than it used to be but if you see the evidence on audit fees that's not happening anytime soon so we've been driving efficiency we've got simplification and standardization but still not everything's working right so that's an interesting um, input to the discussion the second piece which i think is even more dramatic and maybe more recent is disruption going on in business is really fundamental. And whilst we've always talked about the old adage that change is the only constant, it really seems in the past five to 10 years, changes have been stunning, really. Changes in business, which are sourcing from changes in society, changes in markets, behaviors of customers, of suppliers, of stakeholders, and behavior of employees. The emergence of the gig economy, for example, fundamental changes in how business is conducted and how people see their relationship to their employers. Now, the catalyst for these changes, obviously, technology is a big part of it, and the whole transparency and visibility of, visibility of data. Um, I mean, obviously, Uber is a great example. I, I talk a lot about the Uberization of business, about just focusing on consumer convenience and changing the nature by which we as consumers decide to um, live our lives and creating new businesses and killing other ones in the way. So this intense focus on cons consumer inconvenience is a big shift and that's what's driving massive structural changes some of the biggest companies on the planet. So organizations which used to have a customer interaction with distributors are now desperately keen to build personalized consumer experiences. So, which is the drive behind a lot of digital transformation you're seeing. If you add to that, there's imperatives coming from stakeholders and shareholders. Not only must we continue to reduce cost, reduce cycle time, and, but reduce negative consequences also, increase value, increase the impact, resilience. There's a growing awareness and scrutiny now that it's not enough just to produce the results as a business. There's a scrutiny of the how as well as the what. And it's not just what we do within our virtual four walls of our business, it's a team game. So our supply chain partners matter. If you look at some of the uh, feedback that 
uh, some of the Apple, for example, have had with the supply chain partners building components in China. It now matters who you're working with. And this whole idea of a balanced principal performance is what shareholders and stakeholders care about now. And that's been a massive change. So if you take that together with the internal efficiency drive, and there's a lot going on, and you can understand why maybe our view of certain types of risk and indeed fraud are, are starting to change. Now, on the topic of fraud and technology, I thought I'd share this, um, kind of the two stories on this slide really. One is, in the past 10 years, the the, the advance of technology can be seen um, very clearly just by what's been in my jacket pocket. Um, but just two years ago, um, our CFO received this email, and which you'll see there. And when you look carefully, we don't have to look too carefully because it's been expanded, the email for Dan French looks a bit unusual, but on his computer, he didn't see the, the detail of the, the email addresses or Dan French, Dan French, for your perusal, urgent request. If you look at that, the person purporting to be me is asking our CFO the state of the, the, um, the cash balances and accounts and could we do a fast banking chaps transfer. Now, I was walking out of the office and Steve shouted to me, what do you want to know? Yeah, what's that for? I said, I didn't understand. What are you talking about? So he forwarded me the email, I said, that's not from me. Now, we've worked together for a long time. And the thing that really interests me about this isn't the technological innovation about being able to get inside people's processes with an email, but it's the social engineering of that email that's cleverly written that that could well have been my words. It's not, it's not, the, uh, you know, it's, it's not written by somebody who doesn't understand the cadence of a, a business language between two close colleagues at a senior level. So obviously we didn't go ahead with that, but I've done surveys, informal surveys at conferences and other um, forums we run. And every major business I know suffer, is still suffering from this, suffer, has had several attacks or several attempts. Most people have actually paid out money they shouldn't have and had trouble getting it back. Uh, so it's just interesting that the nature of fraud is no longer just, it's. It's not, hidden, it's not hidden away, but also it's been changed by the way in which we live our lives in business. So that's just some thoughts for you. Um, another poll um, for you. Who is responsible for fraud risk in your organization? Is it A, a separate responsibility by fraud risk type, say procurement, procurement fraud, asset fraud, accounting fraud, and so on? Is it risk management function? Is it internal audit? Is it ethics or some other group? Or you're not sure? Again, it'd be useful to share this. These are all anonymous, so it doesn't matter what you say. Um, it's just useful for you as, and us all to get a sense of uh, what's going on. There's a good, a good number of you to make it a statistically uh, sensible response. So uh, please select one of those, one of five. Who is responsible for fraud risk in your organization? Give me 10 seconds. Can we, um, five, four, three, two, one. Let's have a look at that. Um, that's interesting. So the thirty percent of you are not sure, and that actually doesn't surprise me. It might be a little bit shocking to many of you, but it, it doesn't surprise me. And I think that's, um, I think that's important to realise. But the second biggest uh, projection there is separate responsibility by fraud risk type, which does require us to know what all the risk types are, of course, which is one of the problems. So when a new fraud risk type develops, that might be why. Is such an attractive proposition for people mm -hmm. perpetrating these things. 15% in risk management, 15% internal audit, 12% in ethics or another department. That's a really useful insight. So thank you for all of that. So there's a little bit of a, a warm up. I would like now to uh, introduce Dr. Devendra Kadwani. Um, I think it's important to recognize that um, the Open University Business School is in a pretty exclusive group here in the top 1% of global business schools triple accredited. So um, with his uh, views and his experiences and his research, Dr. Devendra Kadwani. Thank you, Dan. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all. So uh, carrying on from where Dan left, we will explore here a bit more about what the types of fraud are. I would like to share with you some descriptive analysis of a large database that was collected uh, in North America and to give you some insights from that. We'll also briefly look at who are the victims and uh, perpetrators of these uh, frauds and what the impact of these is on, on the firms. 
And something that's uh, quite interesting to reflect on in the context of uh, fraud detection or prevention is uh, the role that culture plays. So here I want to relate one story from, which is a research-based story really, uh, from a Japanese context, which I hope you would uh, be able to relate to in, in the context of your societies, wherever you are working in the world. And then we'll back it up with some theoretical empirical work that has happened around fraud prevention and detection and what theory suggests about uh, these behaviors. And then we'll close with some closing thoughts. So there are various types of frauds, but broadly you could categorize them into three. As Dan mentioned earlier on, asset misappropriation is effectively a theft or embezzlement of assets from an organization uh, by employees or other stakeholders within the organization. Then there is corruption, uh, which is influencing uh, business transactions inappropriately for personal gain and advantage. And then we have financial statement frauds. Within that, there will be a range of type of frauds that can take place. We'll have a quick look at some of those details in a minute. But that actually is a deliberate misreporting of financial information in the um, annual reports or the financial statements. And if you see that 69% of frauds are asset misappropriations. And um, uh, looking at the impact of uh, these frauds on actually losses that companies incur on the right side uh, of the slide, you would see actually the losses incurred are more uh, when there are fraudulent statements in the financial reports. And I think partly this is because those are at the corporate level. So size of the losses incurred is much bigger in those cases. Now this, this data draws uh, from uh, the research that I mentioned there by Harris et al. Uh, in Journal of Business Ethics. Okay, and the survey data we are reporting is from a Canadian study. Again, for that link is there at the bottom if you were to look at the full uh, PDF file of the report. Now, who is affected or who suffers because of the frauds? As you can see, victim organizations are across the sectors. They are private companies, public companies, as well as government and not-for-profit. But you can see a large number of them are uh, private company, and maybe that's because they outnumber other forms of companies, that's public companies. Uh, and they are also, in terms of medium loss, uh, median loss is also higher in those companies. So the largest proportion and the most losses incurred are also in private companies, uh, as per that study that I referred to at the bottom. The, Classification of uh, various, so this, this is where we go in little detail about the three types of frauds, corruption, asset misappropriation, and financial statement fraud. Now, several of you attending this webinar are actually uh, internal audit colleagues, so you would be able to recognize many of those types and subtypes within the financial statement fraud. Uh, they, they relate to net income overstatement or net income understatement, and there are various mechanisms by which it happens. Within asset appropriation, people may appropriate, misappropriate cash or near cash items or inventory and other assets. And of course, corruption is a more uh, difficult problem because there sometimes it is not easy to find where the conflict of interest existed, uh, bribery took place. And indeed, there are in illegal gratuities. And, and these cases are difficult in the sense that the legal environment in which you operate might have a different definition of what is illegal or um, illegal gratuity or bribery. So one has to be aware of the institutional context, legal context in which you operate. And, and, and as I report in my one of the findings later on in the research that we think institutional context uh, plays an important role in prevention and detection uh, of the fraud and, and the culture within organization. So this is the study we have been actually drawing information from uh, for this descriptive analysis, which is a detecting occupational fraud in Canada, but it's a, it's a study of thousands of organizations. So uh, by all means, if you are interested to look at in greater detail, look at this uh, report, which is available online free of cost. Now, who are the perpetrators of uh, fraud? So you can say list includes every stakeholder who could be connected with the firm or an organization. Employees are most common for obvious reasons, one would say, 
because they have uh, access to information or uh, their uh, uh, roles and responsibilities allow them to access the uh, assets and the inventories of the organization, board members, volunteers, and independent contractors, suppliers, and others. What's interesting to note on the right side is that there can be owners and executives who indulge in frauds, but they, lay, they made up less than one fifth of the perpetrators, but they accounted for the largest fraud losses. And this is understandable because owners and senior executives would be in powerful positions within organizations. So their ability to do damage uh, will be much more if they indulge in fraudulent activities. Now here I'll show some slides uh, which show some kind of association between various features of the perpetrators and their cons consequences of their behavior. But I would like to put a caveat as an academic, which I showed that these pictures do not necessarily mean there's a cause and effect relationship, but a visible association between two different variables. So on this one, for example, we see that people who are earning high income, uh, and if they indulge in fraud, they also do a lot of damage. So you can see people in high income between 200 and 499,000 Canadian dollars tend to have more impact. Uh, it's a sad reflection in a way on, on human behavior that uh, large income also doesn't stop you from thinking of, uh, thinking of doing things which are not ethically correct. But as I said, I wouldn't say everybody earning high income has more likelihood of uh, indulging in fraudulent activity. Please just bear that in mind. Do people who work for longer period in organization indulge in frauds more frequently and do they cause more losses is what this image is showing. And again, what we see sadly is that people who know organization more by the fact of that they have been around for five or 10 years or more, incur uh, more median losses and the, and the proportion of uh, cases that are reported uh, where people with more experience are involved is also significant. You can see that's nearly 62 third of the uh, total proportion is coming from that category. So uh, again, a little bit, uh, one, one has to be mindful if you were to design the corporate strategies or the uh, the internal control systems and were to put in place some sort of checks and monitoring place, you need to know where the likelihood is. And this is not to again say that all people working for more than five years are likely to do this. This is an association we are looking at, which is interesting. Do more educated people on the right side of this slide um, not engage in fraudulent activity, one would hope that education helps people to become morally more developed, ethically more responsible. But unfortunately, what we find here is again, nearly 36% of uh, uh, fraud perpetrators have a very high level of education degree and uh, postgraduate degree. So again, we as a, for me as it's a message to me as an academician, as a teacher that are we doing right things in our education? What's going on? Uh, why would the bachelor degree holders, one fourth of them indulge in fraudulent activities and incurring uh, average of a million loss. On the right, left side, again, uh, interesting, but one wouldn't read too much. This is a fact here. Uh, males are more uh, in category of fraudulent cases than uh, females, but the per percentage change is big, uh, 71 against 21, 29. So something to reflect uh, really for um, all of us who are in practice uh, in internal audits or other, other roles that we play. Uh, maybe it just reflects the imbalance in the organizations where uh, fewer females may be involved, but in Western democracies, Western developed markets, I would imagine that females are not in that proportion. They are in a much larger proportion as a percentage of employee, total percentage of employees. So I think there is something really worth looking at um, and also they seem to be bold. They are incurring much more damage uh, to organizations through fraudulent activities on average. And one more thing about the age. So one would hope there's a positive relation between as we grow older and become wiser and perhaps more th ethically more responsible. But unfortunately, this slide disappoints from the facts point of view. 
that as you grow older here you see the median loss incurred is higher and the frequency of cases reported from the age groups which are above 40 again is quite large so you got nearly 75% uh, of cases reported from age group uh, 36 and above again some some reflection on our side as, as a society that why age doesn't make us more mature and ethically responsible uh, now I am going to talk a little bit about what happens when organizations prosecute or do not prosecute the cases. Now this information tells that 57.6% of victim organizations referred their cases to law enforcement. That means 42% did not. And why do firms not, or organizations which are victims, do not report to law authorities the issues of fraudulent practices? Uh, and that slide, uh, side of slide, right side of slide shows that 47% of uh, re reporting respondents uh, say that it's the fear of bad publicity which stops them from reporting or prosecuting uh, fraud, um, fraudulent parties. Now, this, this is a message here, I think, for organizations who want to control or detect the frauds and put in place a deterrent. Because as you see next slide, uh, when prosecution happens, 50% do plead guilty without contest sometimes. And 22% are uh, convicted. That means when there is uh, law enforcement, it has significant impact uh, in terms of uh, uh, punishment. And I think those are important deterrent things that we need to worry about. In my opinion, uh, uh, referring to law is desirable option than not referring. That, that's where the culture can be uh, developed and uh, uh, reinforced of uh, no tolerance for corrupt practices. Again, uh, perhaps uh, this slide has a lot of practical implication. If you see what it is showing, that uh, there are various mechanisms of uh, control and monitoring which help with detection of fraud. So on the left side of the screen, you see IT controls, surveillance, monitoring system, account reconciliation exercises, internal audit, and so on. Now, when we look at the duration during which the fraud is detected, uh, those mechanisms seem to be delivering uh, detection or prevention, at least identification of problem in first 12 months itself. So one should be using those mechanisms carefully because early detection, as we can see on the other axis, which is the losses, uh, leads to fewer or smaller amounts of loss. The longer it takes to detect a case, then larger is the damage it can do, uh, can, it does. So one has to put in place mechanisms that are likely to detect problem early on. In the middle, there is something about tip, which is uh, kind of a whistle blowing by employees or other people. And I want to say a little more about tip there. Uh, so if you see the first half of uh, slide shows on the top, detection method and percentage of cases. Now of the total cases which are detected, 42% of those are detected due to someone giving us tip and internal controls. So uh, together, internal controls and tips constitute 60% of successful detection of uh, the cases of frauds. So in my opinion, the biggest tip one can give around this is make it very easy and safe for employees to tip or report the cases. It includes customers and vendors also. I must also say the safety is important here. People should have enough support that if somebody blows whistle, they are protected, their interests are not damaged by this, and organizations would need to put in place appropriate mechanisms to do that. Um, this pie chart actually shows, um, again, who are the people who give the tips. Again, employees and uh, customers, interestingly, are quite a large proportion of that, and so are the vendors. So this shows it's not just the employees, but customers and vendors can also help with the detection of fraud if we put in place appropriate mechanisms for them to report in a safe bad way. Now we looked at a lot of descriptive things. Now here I want to look at the, um, uh, many of you would have heard that 
the stories are anecdotes the japanese are very honest and uh, straightforward people when it comes to conducting themselves socially so uh, one academic from um, us decided to examine that uh, anecdote and say are japanese actually more honest or conduct themselves properly in public life or in uh, professions so the, he took a example of what's called finder's law in japan that when people lose their things with cash or mobile phone or whatever things get returned so there's a law called finder's law in japan similar law exists in us but it varies by state now what we find is uh, this story tells something more than uh, legal enforcement which is what i want to talk about so if you are interested in this academic paper i have put the link there you can look up the paper itself so this came about uh, from a study in tokyo which is urban area and uh, amori which is a rural part of japan and uh, this study reports that when people lose for example umbrellas or clothes or wallets how many of those come back to a loser and as you can see in tokyo percentage of returned goods to owners is 18.3 and percent awarded to finder because the law is that finder when they return they are rewarded in some form or shape actually they get part of the value of what was the returned goods and and in rural area the percentages are quite different so it's 40% uh, who return in rural areas and 22% claim uh, rewards. Similarly about the cash, you can see 72% of cash is returned to owners. Uh, in, in rural areas it is 70% and uh, awarded to find out figures of there. So there is some difference between the rural uh, and urban areas, but actually it's quite high percentage of cash coming back, which is, which is very good. Why does it happen? On the side, uh, left side, you see a picture looks like a temple or pagoda, but actually it is a building called Koban. Koban are, are small community police stations and uh, they are all over place, dotted all over cities and uh, rural areas. People can walk into them in, within a mile or so. So when people find something, they report it to Koban or deposit it there. Koban is a mini police station and many of uh, Kobans are like family friendly. So actually the building you see is looks like a two story building. It has uh, many of the Kobans are resident Kobans, which means a policeman or woman with family stay in that. So it's a family friendly accessible police station where people go and deposit. And this is a cultural thing. But uh, to test whether this uh, holds outside internationally as a cultural behavior, and this researcher tried this uh, another study in us this time and new york uh, in in tokyo so uh, deliberately as a part of experiment a uh, number of phones and cash items were lost in three places tokyo new york and outside a supermarket which was frequented mostly by japanese people but within new york and it resulted in very interesting finding as you can see in tokyo 95 percent of the phones were returned and cash came out in 20 17 cases out of 20. and if you look at the numbers in us 77 returned in new york 84 in new york japanese store outside japanese store now one may read this uh, saying that okay are new york uh, citizens on average less likely uh, to return found goods compared to Japanese well the statistics here gives us support that yes they are uh, but interesting result is uh, New York Japanese returning less than what they would do in Tokyo so is it bad influence of New York or Japanese changing their behavior uh, I don't know when one should not read too much in this but there's something about that culture and I want to talk a little bit about that what could that be so if you go into the reflection on what is happening in Japanese society uh, in this context, I have articulated this as circle of virtue, incentivized in society through an appropriate legal system. Culturally, it is supported by efficient administration and law enforcement. Now, this Koban is a well-oiled machinery administrative system which 
is accessible for anyone they can go into it without fear or any any issues education level is very high in japan which makes difference and i'll come back to education role later the law also requires that one has to return lost property when they find it finder uh, actually gets rewarded and those who don't return they get punished as well police are close by to accept lost objectives so it's not a huge uh, cumbersome task to return there's a centuries old tradition to return found property in japan and to protect finders interest i think there is this centuries old tradition is important because you had to work little more on that to reinforce and make it a habit for people and that reinforcement happens through schools so children are actually rewarded in school and uh, praised as i said both loser and finder are rewarded the returner is rewarded financially or in kind and loser appreciates getting their property back which this is where i feel is a wish a virtuous circle, a circle going on people get reinforced that it's good good to behave well you know now here is a framework or theorizing framework about frauds um, which which is from a 1950 study uh, where three key areas were identified which must be there for a fraud to take place and first among them, them is motive unless an individual has a motive to do something illegal or unethical they wouldn't do it so motive could be anything from greed to dire need for something but motive itself is not enough they must have opportunity and this is where i would like to relate back to position and power in the organization of an employee or vendor or a contractor if they have opportunity only then they can do fraud and at the end of it we are humans so even if i have motive and opportunity i should be comfortable with doing that activity which is morally questionable so uh, there must be a psychological rationalization of that behavior and depending on how developed the moral compass of an individual is they will be able to rationalize or not rationalize so if they can't rationalize even after opportunity and motive many people will not indulge in such activity however we'll talk a little more about whether this triangle captures the full spectrum of what the motivation and uh, and explanation of fraudulent behavior is we think there is more to fraudulent behavior in organization than this so this study don't be put off by the white box uh, it's a uh, just to reinforce that it's it's based on a scientific study done uh, and presented this study tried to find what are the factors which would explain uh, reduction in frauds or detection and prevention of frauds so four factors that this study reported uh, from Harris et al were board level monitoring through audit committees this reduced the probability of an asset diversion what we have called earlier misappropriation it independence of key individuals also reduces the probability of an uh, misappropriation ethical tone at the top reduces the probability of asset uh, diversion i think what this third factor is in my opinion a compound factor because if you have an ethical tone at the top the people who are actually monitoring and uh, doing internal controls work feel empowered because they feel that the top top management support for preventing frauds and i think that's important message here which which uh, one can take away and the presence of capital provider oversight reduces probability of asset diversion again this is uh, classic those of you who are in academic or uh, advanced degrees in finance would know something called agency theory so managers are effectively seen as agents of the principals who are the capital providers and if capital providers have direct oversight then agents are more mindful of what they are doing uh, in on behalf of the principals who are the capital providers I and my colleagues did another study here what makes organizations more vulnerable to ethical scandals now we looked at 253 scandals uh, that were reported in public media and studied some features of the corporate governance in those organizations from the reported annual reports so 
we came up with three clusters of factors which we thought were related to overall organizational ethical vulnerability. And those three clusters were uh, organizational ethical infrastructure, which would include, I said, like tone at the top, other mechanisms, um, training of employees, sensitivity to ethical and legal implications of their behavior, uh, code of conduct, then we had internal corporate governance and financial performance indicators. And then we looked at the impact of external contexts, such as legal, what's the law enforcement in particular country where we have got the case or how effective is the law enforcement, what's the index of openness and transparency and so on. So we tried to capture some of those factors as three clusters. What we found was that uh, financial costs, first of all, to put this in context, uh, that is fines and penalties relating to OEB uh, in these cases, organizational ethical vulnerability are more than 45 billion for a sample of 253 companies that we looked at just in one year. Now this is the recognized cost directly paid by organization as fines. Uh, losses incurred would be much more, are different. What we found are large boards are more likely to be ethically vulnerable. Now this may look counterintuitive to be honest because one would expect large boards are can monitor it closely and so on. But whether we are losing noise or there's a group thing or dominance of uh, some board members, which is not captured in the uh, variable could be the reason. We also found significant positive association between number of board meetings and uh, OEV. In a way, more active monitoring or reaction during potential because our study also had a sample around financial crisis. So my hunch is that this variable is actually picking up a lot of board activity during the financial crisis and risk management activity. Higher executive compensation also may increase OEV because we know from finance theory that options based or bonus based compensation tends to increase the risk appetite within the organization, which then may lose you know, sight of what's going on in the internal controls. Uh, findings also raise a question about the organizational structure that I talked about, infrastructure. Training programs and code of ethics uh, and commitment to business ethics may not necessarily decrease OEV. That means you may still be vulnerable to uh, frauds and scandals even if you have a training program because culture or sharing, uh, shared objectives are more important. Study has also shown that individual and organizational ethical decisions are interrelated in real life. Now, one of the issues with research is that when you do research, you don't necessarily see the whole picture. You are looking at only a small part of the data available. So we were looking only at the published information. One has to see that individuals don't necessarily become different individuals when they come to work. They are still carrying their baggage as cultural and uh, social uh, ambitions, whatever they have. So one has to study this in greater detail by talking to people to actually see whether individuals behave very differently in their personal decisions about finance or economics and when they are doing uh, uh, as part of the business. So I'll stop by saying a few things to consider. One is that frauds happen uh, in all, all sectors. Uh, there are three broad categories of frauds we had talked about. It's worth noting that institutions uh, instituting good corporate governance mechanism, such as internal controls, audit committees, risk committee can prevent and reduce the probability of fraud. Early detection minimizes losses and frequency. I think that's a very strong message in my opinion, uh, worth investing time and uh, um, technology in those processes. Make it easy for employees and customers because that's your second guard against the prevention. Once, even if you fail to prevent, at least detection should be easy to do that. And that fifth point relates to making it easy for people to report and give you tips. Theories of fraud identity, identity uh, identification, opportunity, motive, and rationalization. Yes, they are important things, but I think cultural and organizational environment are important enablers as well as disablers of motives and opportunities. So they, in my, from my research point of view, said one should study this more and evidence should be collected on that. With that, I would like to hand back to Dan. Thank you very much, Professor. That was a really uh, fascinating insight through three different perspectives on fraud. So uh, thank you, Devendra. Um, please ask your questions. Remember, you have a panel in your GoToWebinar 
uh, environment there. You've heard a lot of uh, research, a lot of uh, thoughts here, so I'm sure you've got questions. So please get them in now because it's um, get them while you think about it. So I'm just going to give you some considerations as we come to a conclusion here. And the first thing I'd say, what are we learning? Not just from the research we've heard, but more, more generally. There's no doubt that the opportunity for fraud is on the increase for all the reasons we've discussed, um, the nature of business, technology and so on. But fraud occurrence is also on the increase, as we've heard from the ACFE. This um, interesting discussion about the fraud triangle that uh, Devendra and I have discussed at, at length, and I'm fascinated by this because it's clear, I think it's clear from what we've heard, that motive, opportunity and rationalization is too simple a picture. So there's more going on. And this idea of connectedness, as per the, the Japanese um, example, connectedness matters too. And we know it matters in society for lots of good reasons, but it also ha happens, or also matters in business, perhaps for more reasons than mm. we have hitherto, hitherto thought. So I, I'm fascinated by that, and that's definitely affected our thinking. It's clear we're not getting much better at prevention or detection, so <laughs> that's uh, probably the reason why there's so many of us on this uh, discussion. Um, and technology, we always hope technology is going to solve all our problems, but it is both friend and foe. So um, I, I want to talk a little bit about those things. Now, this is a recent uh, KPMG survey, and they made, uh, they examined uh, 750 fraudsters who had been caught, obviously. What was interesting is 44% of these uh, fraudsters were identified by a whistleblowing or tip-off, mm -hmm. and only 3% detected using proactive fraud-focused analytics, which makes you think that Analytics must be a waste of time and tip offs must be quite good. The only question I have, which isn't, which is uh, not completely obvious, but worthy of thought, is what were the other 53% caught uh, through? And actually the, the research does go into that. But I think the, the point here is very much about fraud analytics. Are there, is it working for us or not? And there's some mixed feelings. So we have a poll, a final poll for you. Your experiences with fraud analytics just five options, please select one. You have not implemented fraud an any fraud analytics. Two, you have a pilot underway developing best practice. Three, you've an optimized effective fraud analytics approach. You've minimized false positives, so it's very uh, precise. Four, it's a slightly more mature fraud analytics supported by an effective management process and clear risk and action ownership. And five, fraud analytics is part of an integrated effective anti-fraud program, and you're pretty happy. So it's five. Can you give us your thoughts on that, please? Uh, just select one, give you 10 seconds. Um, yeah, so uh, five, four, three, two, one. Let's have a look and see what you've told us. So 60% of you have not implemented any fraud analytics, which probably reflects the reason why only 3% are caught using it. But 16% um, are piloting. 10% of you have a very integrated effective fraud uh, program with analytics embedded in it. I think this is interesting. A very, this is kind of uh, on the uh, maturity curve, if you like, from not implemented through to an integrated and effective program. Um, we always definitely share this information. That's uh, very useful. What is an interesting secondary question is what are the primary reasons for not implementing fraud analytics? And the KPMG survey might give you some indication for that. So thank you for that. So. We talked about the fraud triangle. What we have learned is really there are five self-reinforcing counter-fraud strategies we need to bear in mind in any organization. One is we need to understand fraud behaviors and uh, scenarios, not just internal fraud, but ecosystem fraud and the supply chain and all the rest mm -hmm. of it, and external fraud, because not everything takes place. You know, sometimes we are the victims of external um, uh, fraud attacks, as our CFO um, nearly was. Um, Common sense controls, we must never forget the fact uh, that common sense internal controls do work. And because they're preventive, we don't usually see the impact of them. Because they prevent things, it's difficult to see what they prevent. Um, but Devendra showed that as a very early uh, indicator, it's a powerful mm. uh, capability. So these are things like segregation of duties, clear access, clear policies. Optimize data analytics, make sure you've got data analytics that can identify unnatural behavior so that you don't have to wait until the frauds occurred but you can see things that start looking like they might be um, going down that road. Those are all very well, but you need to have a process that works. You can have all of the analytics and all of the controls in place, but if you don't have a risk management process with ownership, understanding and action, it's completely pointless. And I think that is a weakness for many organizations who may try some of these tactics. 
And then the thing that's changed here is this idea of connection and communication. It's not specifically uh, or uniquely a counter fraud strategy, but as we've learned from some of the research that uh, the vendor has shared with us and from observation, it is clear that the connectedness of those in the organization has a massive uh, defensive uh, preventive uh, capability. Mm -hmm. And it also has broader impact because even for external fraud, it makes people more vigilant. If they're more connected to the organization, they're more vigilant about things going on outside that they might not otherwise care about. So, and we also know from experience that working in a connected organization is actually more enjoyable. It has a lot of other benefits. Mm -hmm. So I'd say these are the five self-reinforcing strategies worth thinking through more than we used to think. The process, <coughs> excuse me, just thinking about the end-to-end -end process, which again, sometimes goes missing. Executive ownership, governance, tolerance, we need to understand that. We've talked about understanding and assessing the, the fraud risks and those scenarios. And we need to have a prevention strategy, a detection strategy, and a pursuit strategy. What do we do when we find one? So how do we validate, investigate, prosecute? And as the vendor said, prosecution, whilst it's time consuming, is a very good deterrent. Mm -hmm. And then the communication strategies, so all of that is an important part of the process. Now, technologies as a friend or foe, we all, you know, even, even the most aware of us tend to um, expect technology to do more for us and be more pervasive than in reality it is. And when you think of systems, I'm talking here also about uh, controls and policies as well as technology systems. Many of you will have seen this picture before. It's the entrance to a, a parking lot. You drive in, if you look very carefully in the middle of that picture, there's an electronic parking barrier. You swipe your ID card, it opens, lets you through. On the way out, you do the same thing. And um, every three months, the provider of the electronic parking barrier can come in, they connect to a computer, and they prove that that is 99.99% perfect as a, as a preventive control. It's only when winter comes and the snow falls, you realize that that isn't really the question you need to be answering. And the tire tracks in the snow, to me, relate to the law of unanticipated consequences. It relates to detective analytics to combined with preventive controls. It tells a load of stories, but it's important for us always to remember that the technology, sort of blind belief in the technology is a dangerous, dangerous game. So as consider solutions, what have we learned? Um, uh, certainly from on the journey through has learned a lot of things and our conversations with the vendor have helped us a lot as well. There's no doubt at all that counter fraud, like all risk management, is a living strategy. You can't just have a few policies on the internet and hope that's going to solve the problem. Connection and community in the business is key for lots of reasons beyond fraud, but massively impactful for fraud. So we've even refined our own risk review approach based on these learnings. Most frauds that we have been exposed to and we've worked with both as case studies and specifically with clients, these, ex these exploit the simplest of controls or weaknesses in the simplest of controls, lack of segregation of duties, lack of deleting people's user accounts when they leave the company. A lot of these things happen by people who've actually left the company, but still got access to the systems. Focus on analytics at work, use multiple techniques and disciplines. Lots of excitement. When you talk about analytics, there's lots of excitement about new technologies, AI and machine learning. We've got a three year research program and all this, and there's some very powerful techniques, but don't assume the new techniques are right for everything and a, and a successful fraud analytics approach needs a bit of convention and a bit of uh, innovation without governance and ownership there's no point in doing anything and what we've realized is our three pillars in our little temple you saw at the outset are more connected than ever before mm -hmm. so risk management and internal controls of financial reporting and financial control and compliance and the very process optimization they all relate very very closely so this is a human condition. We always hope for an easy fix to a problem. Is the one thing that I can strike out this issue with? And I like this quote by Atul Gawande. He's a, he's a very well respected surgeon and, and wrote about how to be a better surgeon. And there's a more recent quote by Dave Brailsford, who was the, um, the chief of the GB cycling team in the in recent Olympic Games, who had a, amazing results by not focusing on just you know making sure everyone had more oxygen in their lungs. But this idea of the aggregation of marginal gains, improve everything by a small percentage, makes a massive increase. And I think that's true in a lot of business endeavors and certainly true in counter fraud. So considerations and recommendations from what the vendor has talked about and our own observations, I would consider and develop a connection and communication strategy. Not necessarily 
within the context of fraud, but more broadly, but around collective responsibility. Understand fraud scenarios and behaviors against your business model, your business, your process, and, and compare and learn from peers and other organizations. And not every organization is the same, not every business model is the same. Make sure you've got common sense preventive controls. We've talked about that. You've got your joiners, leave, movers, levers, governance fixed. Implement optimized smart fraud analytics and develop a management process that you know who's responsible for what as you go through these processes. And I guess with every discussion which has a, a looking at technologies and new approaches, there's this uh, inevitable maturity curve with this peak of inflated expectations. As I mentioned earlier, people think, oh, artificial intelligence is going to solve all these problems or blockchain is going to solve all these problems or something else which nobody understands probably. <laughs> And the reality is that uh, this is a Gartner uh, hype cycle, but I love this. The fact of the matter is we have these inflated expectations. We slither down to the trough of disillusionment. We go up, we crawl up the slope of enlightenment, eventually get to productivity. These kind of discussions are, are really designed to help us chop the top of that peak of inflated expectations, have a sense of reality and get to a productive world more quickly. So. That's what we've talked through. I hope you found it useful. I know we are very, very late, but we're gonna take one question because, um, because we said we would and we should. And, um, and I know it's 56 minutes, so we're just gonna be a couple of minutes on this. Apologies for taking a little bit too long. But you talked about this connectedness as a cultural phenomenon. What can we do specifically to enhance this in our business? I like this question because it's the, the root of a lot of what Devendra and I have been discussing. Have you got any thoughts on that, Devendra? Any further well, I, thoughts? I think you say uh, organizations are a collection of individuals with several responsibilities and uh, with a shared objective. So, in connectedness, first is that there is a social psychological uh, kind of a loyalty to a group when you are part of it. You start respecting and caring for one another. And that itself can be a dampener in one's thinking, even if one had a strong motive, it makes, it raises a rationalization bar in a way of morality. Yep. If you are connected more with organization's purpose and uh, uh, respect your colleagues, because at the end of the day, uh, stakeholders within our organization who are victims of uh, frauds suffer the consequences. Now stakeholders include your colleagues and so on. So more one can reinforce that sense of fairness with your colleagues and the other stakeholders who are involved in organization less likely is one to consider uh, indulging in fraudulent activity and perhaps it also creates atmosphere for uh, whistle blowing people become less tolerant of that yeah. kind of a behavior because just not equal uh, kind of a treatment of your colleagues yeah i think that's a great example yeah but but there's also this question around other things that are happening isn't yeah. it? so I, I i think that the whole issue of belonging i mean i think if if you feel you don't have connectedness in your organization yeah. i don't think there are any quick fixes that's the first yeah. thing which is a bigger issue yeah but if if you've got some of it and you just want to strengthen it i think that's the idea of connecting to the purpose of the organization yeah. does everyone feel a part of it mm. fairness we've talked about yeah. if executive management are, earn, are known to earn 100 times the salary of the average person Oh, yeah. you, know, you don't feel it's fair yeah you know, that's i know there's a lot of debate about that but it, there's yeah. a sense there yeah um is the carers respect for and by the organization can you demonstrate that mm -hmm. collective commitment and responsibility I, there's a really good education in fact education is a key part of this but there's a really good example on youtube which you can search the uk national health service have a counter fraud authority which have got great approach in terms of videos they provide to all employees mm -hmm. which help people understand that fraud is both prevalent mm -hmm. but they have a collective responsibility to prevent it and also collective impact because of its effect so it hurts everybody mm -hmm. and i think you should if you're interested in this look at their videos and think about doing something similar in fact use the same one because it's very very good you can, if you if you can't find it send me an email and i'll point you to it but i think it's very very good simple video Anyway, we have a lot of questions. We will respond to you all by email. I do appreciate you taking uh, nearly an hour with us today. I want to thank uh, Dr. Devendra Kadwani for his time. It's been really insightful. Um, if you have any more questions you haven't asked yet through the system, send me an email and I will discuss with Devendra. We'll get back to you. And um, I, hope you've, uh, I hope you've found it as stimulating as we have. Thank you very much.